in 2017 when I got my license. I was like invisible. I was at these practice companies. They didn't even see me. Across two very successful companies, about six months at each one, 13 months, no sales. And then in um, the spring of 2018, I came to FFL. I helped like 19 families in my first three weeks here at FFL. And I thought to myself, so this is what I was supposed to be doing all along. Hey everyone, how are we doing today? Um, we have a really exciting guest today. We have Brad Allen on and uh, Brad is one of our uh, annuity specialists. And uh, before we get going with Brad, uh, Factory, what's this up and coming with uh, FFL? All right, so we've got our Stay Connected, FFLUSA.com forward slash connect, get plugged in. Um, let's see, agents get 50% off with Lead Center with their with our uh, new Automate and Save. Go ahead, the next one. All right, so December agency incentive. This is a interesting one. The um, agency who gets the most registrations will get a $10,000 lead voucher for the lead credit um second would get 8500 and then a new agent uh, agency who gets the most new agents contracted will get ten thousand dollars in lead voucher and that is good until we'll go back end of december yep and then next we've got eric Kamadi, who's our newest integrity partner congratulations nice. eric Kamadi. <clears throat> and then we've got our lock-in december 19th it's it's two Today, Tuesday, Wednesday, we've got some big hitters there. Andrew Taylor, Stephen Yee, Alondra, Josh, Trey, and Zach Trudowski. Um, you can register at FFLUSA, holidayparty.eventbrite.com. Um, definitely make sure you guys get there. And then lastly, we've got our quote of the day, leadership is influence. John C. Maxwell. Very nice. So, Brad, how you doing today, sir? <clears throat> How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. So I got to spend some time with Brad and his wife and asked a bunch of questions. And I was really fascinated because uh, Brad had a kind of a unique experience when he first. So Brad, tell us a little bit about yourself. But Brad came from the technical side of the business. And then he decided, he told his wife, hey, I'm going to try sales. And I'm going to, uh, she's like, go for it. And he didn't make his help for 13 months. Brad, tell us about who you were before FFL and then what success you had once you joined the ranks. Sure. Well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, let's see. I think it was about this time in 2017 when I got my license. And I had responded to a Zip Recruiter ad. And it was a practice company captive agent. But they really wanted me to be a stockbroker. You know, they wanted me to go in and get my Series 7 and what have you. And so I studied for all that. They kind of looked down on life insurance. And um, it really impacted me because when I see new agents here at FFL, I definitely stop and pay attention and give them my attention. Because when I was at these practice companies, I was like invisible. They didn't even see me. You know, I was putting in the dials, but I didn't really sit with anybody across two very successful companies, about six months at each one, um, no sales. I, I sat with one prospect, kind of. It was my firstborn child, and he wanted to think about it. So I took that as a win. Um, so yeah, 13 months, no sales. And then in um, the spring of 2018, I came to FFL. And when I first sat down, they kept asking me, you know, what's my IP? What's my IP? After a couple of times, I said, what, what on earth is IP? You know, where I come from, that's internet protocol. Um, so what is IP? It's like, you know, issue pay. It's like, okay, what is that? <laughs> and so it's like, well, you know, when you get paid, it's like, oh, okay. Now I understand the disconnect. I've never been paid. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> this is for a year and you've never been paid? It's like, no, is that, is that a problem? like, well, no, the, you know, the copy's on me, you know, let me know how it turns out, dud, right? It's like, this guy's a non-starter. Um, and then I, I found out that we have leads. See, I'd never seen a lead before. It's like, what on earth is a lead? And it's like, well, you know, when somebody asks for you to help them, 
I said, well, that's a great idea. How many of those can I have? And they said, well, as many as you can afford. It's like, great. And I just kept swiping my credit card. I think I helped like 19 families in my first three weeks here at FFL. And I thought to myself, so this is what I was supposed to be doing all along. See, they never had leads. So when Sean Mike says no leads, no business, I am a living testimony to that. If you don't have people to see, if you're really dependent on friends and family and Rotary Club, it's going to be pretty tough sledding. I can tell you firsthand. I love that. No leads, no business. I love that. I come from House of Blues and our godfathers, we call them the OGs, said no band, no brand. Because if you brought the music, everyone would buy your souvenirs, they would buy your merchandise, they would eat your food and drink your drinks. But if you didn't have the right bands in there, you were going to be empty. And yeah. I love that. That That's the motto. No leads, no business. So right. you what did you start selling at first? You just didn't start selling annuities. I mean, that's a scary thing, I know. And that's why I want you on because everyone, I, I've been telling a lot of people after you know talking to you, a lot of you, especially you, uh, Brad, if you have a final expense lead or if you have a any lead, right? And if you don't ask the magic question, these people might have money and not know what they're to do with it. So what is the magic question that you ask, Brad, to get yeah. the information? So yeah, and when I'm doing my financial inventory, that's it's all in the questions that you ask. It doesn't really matter what lead type it is. If you're in an appointment, whether it's final expense, mortgage protection, uh, Medicare, you know, I've written more life volume since I've been with Family First Life. I've written more life volume than annuities. Most people don't know that, but I've, I've hit Hall of Fame on the life side every single full year I've been in the field. So a lot of people don't know that. And how I find my annuities I mean, traditionally, it's just with the silver and the gold question. So the silver question is liquidity. Like you go through household income, expenses, and then discretionary income. And I always say, are you savers? If you were to look in the bank on any given Tuesday, what do you normally see? And I ask that silver question for two reasons. Number one, if they don't answer me, like you don't need to know that. Well, then I've got some trust issues that I need to overcome. And I want to know that early on. And I also want to know if they could even afford the monthly premium that I'm about to recommend to them for the life product. But when you ask that question consistently, oftentimes what I find, like let's say it's a final expense appointment. The, the person's, you know, 78 years old. They're healthy, but they're past the age of term, right? You're looking at a whole life product. And, you know, it's 10000 in coverage for $110 or something like that, right? And, and you hear the words, well, I could just take that money out of the bank. Right. And that used to really frustrate me. Like the opportunity is just gone. Why am I even sitting here? I look at it completely different now because I just say, oh, well, you can self-insure. That's an annuity opportunity, right? Because the range on an annuity is ten k to 2 mil. So, you know, practice on the smaller ones, take 10, 20, 30, 50 K from just liquid cash and use that as their final expense policy. It costs them nothing. There's no risk. There's no fee and there's no cap on their gains. So it's like, hey, self-insured, that's the silver question, just liquid cash. And if you ask it consistently, cross <clears throat> some cash, right? It's like, oh, I got 110,000 in the bank. It's like, well, why is it sitting there earning 0. 0.00 dirt for interest? Right. <laughs> Collecting dust, right? Yeah. So Collecting that's it. Dust. So wait a minute. So let me just, so 10,000 is the minimum up to 2 million. Correct. Perfect. Okay. So what is the gold question? So when I do my financial inventory, I always start with money, like cash flow. People buy on price when they see there's enough value there. But I, I need to know what their budget is. And I always run the appointment I'm there to run. My second section of my financial inventory is all about assets. So I say, what do you have that acts like insurance that would pay off liabilities at the time of death? So, you know, like a 401k. 
or a 403B TSP, it could be stocks or bonds. Do you own any life insurance? You know, something that you actually have a contract, not the stuff at, at your workplace, because if that was your policy, you would have a contract, right? Yeah. You don't contract, do you? No, that's because it's their policy, not yours. Let's focus on what you have. So I always try to overcome objections before I get them. But I look at that asset section and I say, well, maybe you don't even need me. So let's not put another bill, you know, another expense in your estate that you don't need. We can just protect your liability with your own assets, kind of like self-insuring from just liquid cash. And if you ask that golden question, what do you have that acts like life insurance consistently, you're going to uncover some 401ks, some stocks or bonds. And I just ask people, does the market make you nervous? And, and it's a simple question. I mean, some people will say yes, some people will say no. But if, if the market makes them nervous, it's like, well, what if I could show you how to protect and grow that without risk? Would that make sense? Let's set up a follow-up appointment in a couple of days where I can bring in a, a, you know, a specialist to help me. And that's what I did in the beginning is I just split my deals because I didn't know what I was doing. I would rather have half of something than all of nothing. And I was getting paid to learn. And I only gave away my commission two times. It's like, okay, that's enough. I don't want to keep giving away my commission. I got to figure this stuff out. And it's really not that complicated. Right, right. So that's why we have the SRS team, right? And can you tell them what that stands for and how that all works? Because I think it's important for our new agents to not be afraid to ask the golden questions and then to have a, heart, a good problem to solve, right, for their uplines, and then to get them to the right people, which we can go right into HCMS, go to Gateway, says ask a specialist right there, right by your, right above your, your web page that they just created for us. So kind of tell us what that is, and then what is the splits, and how does that work? Sure. So that's our simple retirement solutions. So instead of advanced market sales, there's just this connotation that you need to climb the mountain, you know, drop your request, and then we'll get to you when we can. It's so advanced, you just like, don't worry your pretty little head, we'll figure it out for you. We're, we're like turning that around 180 degrees. This is not complicated. So simple retirement solutions, right? Um, so there's six of us. And we're geographically spread across the country. And when you ask a specialist, you're going to get one of us that's going to jump in and help you close that case and help that family protect their assets. And so if it, uh, all you need is kind of like agent in the house, I'm just not sure. I'm in the middle of an appointment. Do I go left or do I go right? That's like a 10% split. But if you really don't even know what you're doing, like I don't even know how to spell annuity. Like when I started... I was just happy that I uncovered an opportunity and I let somebody run the appointment, but I was getting half the commission. So that's an option as well. If you don't know what you're doing and you want to learn and get paid to learn, that's a 50-50 split. Once I run the appointment, you're watching. The second one, 50-50 split, you're running the appointment and I'm watching, making sure that you don't like, you know, end up in the in ditch. Um, and after that, you should really be pretty good. And so I know there's suitability. And then what is the hardest part? Is it the money transfer? Because I know years ago when I did an annuity, the and we're going to talk about financial planners too. And I didn't know if you did the shares or the money amount to be transferred. I messed that up. And um, then that guy... The financial planner jumped in and was like, oh, and got scared her away from me, this lady. And I, I missed a golden opportunity, but we didn't have the SRS team or I would have, it was a $17,000 commission I would have made and I didn't make anything. And I went to the house like nine times and the husband was on his last uh, leg and he's like, I'm just going to let it roll. Mine's all in super high aggressive stocks and um, I want to try to make as much before I go for her. But she needs a safe haven, and there, she couldn't even get a hold of her financial planner for three years. He ignored her, and then she still listened to him in the end. So um, what help us with, with that part. So if you're – I mean, I would all – me, I feel like everyone should eat the table. A bird in the hand is better than two in the bush, and I would rather just ask for help 
and get paid and help a family instead of wing it and mess it up like I did. But we didn't have the great tools that FFL has now. I mean, the company was just starting off. I think everyone was winging it, trying to figure it out. We had our Sean Riggio's, we had our experts and stuff. And then um, it's grew up, blossomed into this big powerhouse company that really gives all the knowledge for free. And I just, I think a lot of people are like, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm not, I don't want to give 50%. And it's like, why wouldn't you give, especially if if you find somebody like Sean Mike talked about that he went to a trailer and there was a couple there and he was like, I don't even know if these guys got anything. And I think it was final expense. And I think they work for Staples and he asked the golden question and lays like, well, I got a million in my pension. And he said, he about fell out of it. Like, wait, what? And he had to call his friend who wasn't going to do it if he didn't do a split and there wasn't anything for him. And then the husband had even more or the wife, one of them had like 1.3 and he walked out of there like, I got to start selling annuities. Like this is, and how much, I know you have eight, let's see, you have 10 million in force this year in annuities? Uh Nine, and I've got a couple million pending, so we'll see where it lands. We're running out of time, but I'm optimistic um, yeah. that we'll pass the 10 mil barrier. Yeah. So talk about the suitability because there, there's that part too, right? We just, hey, I got I got a, you know, 300 grand, but I don't have anything else. And can I put this 300,000 in annuity or does it have to be only 150,000? Because how's that work? Sure. So the entire flow is you submit an application via Firelight, okay? And that is somebody that's going to review it for suitability. That usually takes about a day, maybe two. And once they've passed through suitability, essentially suitability is the underwriting, like on the life side, you know, are they healthy enough to qualify? On the annuity side, there's nothing to do with your health. Right. It's everything with cash flow and asset to debt ratio. So as long as your money's not parked somewhere and you feel like you always have to be going over 10%, that's not, they don't want that. They want you feeling very comfortable accessing your account if you need to within 10%, and that's just perfectly fine. That's essentially suitability. So once you get through suitability a day or two, you get a contract number and they will send out typically transfer instructions for the money to move. So you find the money, that's the first stage. The second is that you submit the application and get suitability and a contract number. The third is the funding piece. Now the funding, it can be a little tricky because now everybody knows what you're trying to do, right? right. You've got a financial advisor that woke up, who's trying to move my money, right? And right. They, they do fear and doubt. They try to talk the person out of it. You know, it's, it's just that they don't want to lose an asset under management because that's how they get paid. The more assets they manage, the more fees that they collect, and that's how they pay their bills. I totally get that. I had that job. What we do is different. We protect money without risk or fee or cap. So if you are done with your, you know, kind of accumulation speculation phase and you want some certainty and some guarantees, well, that's, that's the people we're looking for. And from start to finish, it should take between two and three weeks. Kind of think of the flow like a fully underwritten medical application on the life side. You know, they're like, no, I don't have hepatitis C. I can prove it. Just pull my blood and urine. So you order a paramedic exam. It takes a week to go to the lab. And then ultimately, a couple, three weeks, policy issues, everybody's happy. Similar flow, right, from a timing standpoint. Very nice. So, um. And do you just write a theme or is what's your favorite carrier with the annuities? Yeah, it's a theme. I've done hundred percent of my business so far this year with a theme. They just have everything we need. Like uh, two days ago, I wrote my first MICA. So that's a multi-year guaranteed annuity. It's a fixed annuity. And on a five year, no, actually they did a seven. Well, the five and the seven year rates were the same, 5.75. That's really good because remember, it's kind of like bank account, money market, CD, bond, fixed, and then index, and then the casino, the stock market, right? So risk reward. So there's nothing wrong with fixed, um, but you're locked into that rate. 
but they have everything. They have indexed income annuities and they have indexed accumulation annuities, and then they have the fixed. And so the portfolio is good. The rates are good. It's, it's really a very nice portfolio for our clients that we serve. Their rates are really good at the beat. And they win like annuity of the year and they've got, you know, A rating and they're big and they're good. And yeah, I'm just happy with them. And they, and they actually, they're like ethos. They're everywhere. Like if you're on Google, if you're on social media, you see that bridge and it says Athene bridge. You know what I mean? It's really, really cool. So what, okay. There is an 80% bonus, correct? If somebody moves their money and what product is that? And then does that in every state? Or how does that work? And then, so if, so I have a lady that's in Washington, the state of Washington, and I was just going to get her uh, IULE from Moo, and she was just looking for burial, 25 grand. And then I asked a question, hey, do you have anything in X? Like, I'm sure it's not protected by the market. She's like, yeah, actually, I have an IRA. It's 350 grand. And I'm like, oh, is it a Roth? And she's like, no, it's been tax deferred. And so I'm like, well, what are you going to do? I'm going to leave my kids. I said, you know, they're going to pay a lot of taxes on that, right? And she was like, no, I didn't even, he just said, don't, if you don't have to touch it, don't touch it. It's going to grow and it's grown. And I said, yeah, it looks sexy, but when it's time to pull it, it's going to get hammered with taxes because there's, they're going to get taxed by three different ways. And so I said there, there might be an opportunity. I, I never promise. I always just kind of set the plate and plant the seed, but there could be an opportunity. You can get an 80% bonus and then make up to 5% a year. You'd be like on an escalator that just goes up. And then in a bad year, it's going to go flat line and you're in a safe bubble. And then when the markets pick up again, it's going to go up. Am, am I selling this right, Brad? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the incentives for the products are state by state. Okay. So like what you're talking about is the Athene performance in the Right. And the plus means that there's going to be a cash bonus, not an income bonus. That's a bigger paycheck for life that's doled out over the life of the contract. Um, but if it's an accumulation or growth index annuity, the performance of these plus, in Washington, it's a 16% bonus. In Oregon, California, it's a 16% bonus. In Arizona, where I'm at now, it's 18. So <clears throat> it is state by state. And that comes with a 0.95 rider charge. So think of it this way. On a 10-year contract at an 18% bonus, over the life, you would pay 9.5, but they're giving you 18. So no matter how you slice it, when you look at an illustration, even if the market dropped 10 years in a row, your account value wouldn't drop because of the market. It would drop because of the fee. But because the bonus is so large, it outpaces the cost of the fee. Everybody's taking the free money this year, for sure. And then when, what would be the last date of this of this month to get it in this year? I mean, I know you said you have some stuff pending that might roll over, but if you were to write something, what would be kind of the cutoff for this year? Right now. Right now. Okay, yeah. right now. So if this person has, it's been tax deferred, and there's a death benefit on the um, annuity, correct? If they pass away and it goes to their beneficiaries, do they pay? How does that work? It would be an inherited IRA. So they inherit that tax burden and mm -hmm. they need to settle it. And um, over a 10 year period, they have to reconcile, you know, like the ladies have to spend it down. So um, inherited IRAs, um, to answer somebody's question here, when would I need to pivot from a theme? Well, I just had a situation that came up with somebody that inherited 450,000 or 460,000 from their father, okay? And um, inherited IRAs before 2020, a theme was doing. Now, after 2020, if you inherited an IRA, it needs to be from your spouse. So like in his situation, since it's from his father and his father passed away in 2021, I couldn't look at a theme. 
I had to look at one of our other carriers. So I looked around and National Life Group as, actually could do it. So that's the illustration that I ran for the family was some of the money was sitting in a place where I could do the Athene product with the bonus that they really wanted. And then the inherited money, I showed them a National Life Group annuity where they would do that inherited IBRA from 2021. Oh, I see. So you didn't have them roll it all over and, and keep it alive in a theme. You had them split it up to make for, right. I get it. Right. Right. Really cool. So what happens if, you know, how do you, what's the rebuttal when they said, I got to share it with my financial advisor? What, 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 how do you pivot? What do you do? So because they I, always I, say that, right? I mean, it's, it's like, that's like their little protective shield on us. Oh, I got to bring it to my financial advisor. And what I think is, wow, how many years have you had them? That's amazing. But I'm really thinking, how much have you paid this person? Like your money to when you could use us and we get paid directly from the insurance company and you keep your money. So how do you, how do you re do that rebuttal, Brad? For the most part, the deal's done at that point it's just a lost opportunity um it, it really is when somebody says they need to talk to their friends or their brother or their in-laws or their you know they're kind of abdicating decision making to a third party think think on the life side i have to talk to my children before right. i want it but i have to talk to my daughter how how often does that actually get done pretty rare right this is kind of like that same objection but on steroids, because it's just an excuse when it's your child. Most people don't look to their children for financial advice. It's just an excuse. But in this case, they actually are paying this person for financial advice. And so it's a great objective. And here's what I say, and it, and it rarely works, but this is what I say. Um, well, that's great. The questions that I would ask your financial advisor is, can they guarantee that they're not gonna charge you fees? Can they guarantee you're not gonna lose any money? Can they guarantee you're gonna get a paycheck for life? So these are loaded questions. I already know the answers to these questions. They don't do what we do, so they can't say yes to any of those questions. Because I have this job. And so when you're on the other side of the aisle, what you have is basically greed or fear. Like you don't want to miss out when the Fed pivots and all of a sudden it's, you know, milk and honey and everybody's winning like a couple of years ago. You don't want to miss out on that, right? Fear of missing out. Or like, oh, well, your money's locked up. You know, there's all kinds of fees. How did you meet this person? Were they in a big shiny building? And look how shiny my shoes are. And, you know, remember when I made you all that money and it'll be fine. Remember back in the day, you know, they don't have what we have. We have certainty. They have speculation. So you're just kind of playing one against the other. And if I always say, well, invite me into the conversation. I mean, if you look at a fiduciary, and a suitability requirement, they're both client focused. Okay, so I can tell you, I promise 100%, I can say guarantee, and I guarantee you I'm going to put your needs first. This is not about me, this is about you. And if you would like to know that there's guarantees of no losses going forward, remember you have your accumulation years and you have your preservation years. So if you're at the point where you don't want to keep starting over and hanging in there and waiting for the bounce back, buy low, sell high, get high, let's lock in those gains and never look back. I guarantee you the market will not drop your account. I can say that here's an illustration. Why don't we talk about this illustration in front of your financial advisor? And as long as I'm sitting in the room, they can't poke holes in it. I love if you send an illustration and they try to show it to a financial advisor, you're completely sunk because they don't know how to represent it and you're not there to defend it. And so the financial advisor, you know, even as a fiduciary, they're supposed to put the client first. They've got bills to pay too. So they're going to, it's a one-sided argument. 
well, what about this? You know, it's like, I don't know. He just gave it to him. I, what about that? I don't know. So, you know, those are the things that I do to overcome that objection. And I, and I head it off up front. When I'm asking about where the money is, it's like, oh, well, it's a company ABC. How did you do in 2022? Did you lose about 20% of your portfolio? Yeah. Would you like to not keep starting over since you're 68? Yeah. What if I show you a, a situation where you protect what's in there, roll it over at no cost, no tax event, get an 18% bonus and never look back? How does that sound? Man, that sounds too good to be true. How do you make money? How do they make money? You know, and, and so it's like, well, it's an IRA to an IRA. So, so when it's qualified money, like a 401k or a traditional IRA, it's a rollover. There's no tax event and there's no cost. And they're option contracts, not shares. So it's an, always a realized gain. If the market's up, you participate it, lock in gain. As opposed to where you're at now, unless you perform a transaction to do a distribution and sell some of your positions, those are not realized gains or losses. It's all on paper. So it's kind of like cats and dogs. Right, they want you to stay in speculation for a fee because you might make a lot of money. Greed, and we're talking about people that don't want to keep. We're looking for savers, not investors. And the difference between an investor and a saver is an investor is willing to let it burn. I didn't get this money without putting it all on eleven black. Let it ride. I'm 85, and that's how I that's the way I roll. That's not your guy, right? You're looking for the for the saver that doesn't want to lose any money. Kind of like this. It's like, all right, so we're going to go to Las Vegas. How much are we willing to lose? What's our budget? 10K, 20K, 50K? It's like, oh my God, no, five. I mean, like one. I, I don't want to lose more than one. That's a save, right? So think of it the same way in your retirement. How much of your retirement are you willing to lose before you protect it? 10K? How long did it take you to save 10K? 100K? So I've got a lot of clients that lost 20% last year, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and it's like, how often do you want to keep doing that? Because you're getting close to retirement. How many more times are you willing to start over because your guy or your gal says, hang in there. It's going to bounce back. I promise you, right? It's like, no, I'm going to take my money. Thank you for getting it to a point where it's worth protecting so that's that's how I do it. Yeah, I like I like the fact you you talk about fiduciary because that's something that I told us later. I said, you know, you have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure you're making money. And do you know what that means? Can you explain what that is? To, so because I know that's a big word. A lot of people don't know what that is. And we have re fiduciary responsibility, right, with our clients. I mean, we're trying to find them the best possible uh, product out there for them, and we're trying to make sure that they're taken care of. And the best thing about annuity is doesn't matter if they're sick. Like you said, there's no medical that has to go with it. As long as they have money, we can put it in a safe spot and watch it grow. And then the, on the down markets, it stays and they don't lose. So, and I know I'm 54 and I've been in uh, with T. Rowe Price and a few other things for a long time. And through compound interest and time, I've made a little bit of money and I'm kind of sick of looking at the yo-yo of the stock market. Right now, it's hot, right? It's doing great. Everything's great. And that's what I'm sure the financial advisors are telling their people. But kind of explain, like, because that's a great way, I think, to attack the client and say, hey, you know, he does have a fiduciary responsibility with you. And are you making money or did you lose money? Because we're going to put you in a product that's not going to cost you anything. And we're going to guarantee it never loses. So, so we have different but very similar responsibilities. So we have a life license, and that makes it that we have to get people through suitability. Is this suitable? Whether it's life or annuities, is this suitable? Did I take them from, you know, a five thousand um, uh, dollar in insurance contract where they're paying thirty bucks? And then I put them in a $3,000 product that was like, you know, twice the price. That would not be suitable. I didn't put them in a better position. On the life side, you could get in trouble if you're putting people in a worse position for having met you. It's the same thing on the annuity side. And it's all about the cash flow, that they're okay with having no more than 70% of their asset base in annuity contracts. So it's like your entire state's worth a million bucks. 700K max is going to be in annuity contracts. 
because you need to be able to pay your bills and feel like you have adequate liquidity. On the fiduciary side, they're just supposed to put the client's interest first instead of churning the account and having all these transaction fees. So I'm gonna move you into soybeans, I'm gonna move you out of soybeans, I'm gonna move you back into soybeans. Every time there's a transaction, I get paid. That's churning an account. That's not being a fiduciary. That's not helping the client, that's helping you. Our, our requirements are very similar in the definition of fiduciary and suitability, um, but we have a suitability requirement and as an investment advisor or registered representative, broker dealer, on the speculative security side, that's a different license and a different requirement from a fiduciary standpoint. So a lot of people will ask me, are you a fiduciary? Well, I used to be when I had to be a registered rep for these, for these companies, my practice companies. But here's what you say if somebody says, are you a fiduciary? It's like, I don't have to be because I never put your money at risk. I so like that. <clears throat> you can't lose money based on my recommendation. We're protecting your money. It's not ever going to drop due to the market. So I have different requirements with my license. I protect assets. I don't put them at risk. You're transferring your risk in your portfolio to the insurance company. They're managing your downside risk. And what they get out of it is the 10% you have access to, the other 90, they're investing just like a bank. That's how they make money. And so somebody does the, um, let's say they do the, they want the 18% bonus and we have to, they have to keep that money in that product for 10 years. Is that correct? And then, but can they draw from that or can you kind of explain like how that works? So, cause I just want the agents to understand that. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity we're missing because we all buy leads or we get leads somehow through Facebook and we're doing whatever. We're talking to a ton of people and we're missing this opportunity. And I think if we really, like Frankie was saying, if we really dive into the annuity piece and take the, the scariness out of it, I think this company is going to go grow even bigger, right? I mean, it's going to, I mean, annuities could be as big as life sales. No, for sure. So we have a huge opportunity because we, we have about three, less than 5% adoptions. So the people we have active writing agents and family first life, less than 5% are writing units. So the sky is the limit. We have a very, you know, engaged, young, hungry, our culture, we work. We just don't use our entire life. So I, you know, we're the market disruptors on the life side, we came in with our business model and we just like own the place, but not on the annuity side, but we will. We start getting the word out and showing how simple this is with the SRS team side by side, 50-50 splits. And then all of a sudden it's, we're not looking to fish for everyone. We're looking to teach everybody how to fish for themselves so that they can then teach others and teach others. And it's like, I, I'm teaching people that are then doing their splits with other people on their team. So that's the goal is to grow the adoption of the annuity side with our license. And I could see us being like 10x easy. So if we're at 200 million now on the annuity side and we go 10x, you know, 2 billion on the annuity side, then we're starting to look like the companies that I came from. Like life insurance is very, very important. Everybody dies, but also people don't like losing money. So use your entire license and you will really be a full, well-rounded agent that can be complete in support of the clients you're sitting in front of. They won't be canceling any of your policies. I've had over 60 annuity contracts issued this year, zero chargebacks. So if you're tired of chargebacks, you might want to give me a call because I don't get chargebacks. That's awesome. So what is your proficiency then? Uh, you, I think you told me it was like for an annuity for anyone, it's almost like 90 something percent, right? Or am I wrong? No, I mean, company wide, I think we have like a 3% chargeback ratio on annuities and 70 um, is the persistency on the life. So it's like 10 times more volatile on the life side. 
you bought a lead, name is dialed, set an appointment, name got a guest, got paid, didn't keep it. 30% of your business falls off on the life side just as an average, but like one tenth on the annuity side. It's very rare once somebody removes their risk for them to want to change their mind and reintroduce risk. If you do it right, once you close them, then they're your client for life. And then there's referrals and you can get in and do life stuff as well. I mean, my overall book of business between life and annuities is I think 93%. So I, I don't get too aggressive on monthly premiums for the life side. I just keep them around 10 to 15% of their discretionary income. So it's sustainable. And then oftentimes I'll pivot and put multiple products in that house, which also raises the persistency level. And I hire every client that I talk to. And people just want to cancel my contract because they don't want to kill the dream of becoming an entrepreneur and joining my agency. So I try to hire every single client I sit with. So if you're a brand new agent and you're listening in on this call, what would you suggest to them if they just did one annuity almost? Because I know Sean Mike said he always tried to get just one annuity. What would that do to their bottom line for them? And then it's kind of explain like how that helps everything, your chargebacks, your everything. Yeah. So, so if you did one average size annuity a month, which shouldn't be hard to do if you're consistent at asking the right questions in your life appointments, let's say that you get one average size annuity to issue on a monthly basis. And that would be like $138,000 annuity. So you would be, you know, like 1.5 million for the year. And at the, and at the starting prompt, you're going to have like, you know, 75K extra cash flow that's really basically non-charge backable. And what you can do with that is that takes the pressure off of you for no-shows, porches, chargebacks, staffing costs, you know, if you're running a business, there's expenses to running a business. And so having cash flow that isn't like temporarily yours, like a small business loan until something charges back, having that predictability in cash flow, you can start to get a pretty predictable expense ratio in your business as well. So I, I was always like 90% um, life, 10% annuities, and then it was 80% life and 20% annuities. This year, um, it'll be probably more like um, 70, 30 <laughs> annuity to life. It, I kind of flipped the script because, because 2022 was such a volatile year and people lost so much money. There's just opportunity every time you turn around. And here's the thing. Once you break the seal and you sold an annuity, they start popping out of the woodwork everywhere. It's like, man, I didn't even know how many there were until I saw what it actually looked like. Now I know what I'm looking for. So my first year, I wrote two, then four, then it was like um, 14, then 28. I keep doubling each year because it's, it's just easier to see because now I know what I'm looking for. And that's the same thing. Once you break the seal, it's off to the races. And so, it's, well, it's a bull band. So your first year, you wrote two. Then your next year, you wrote four. You doubled it. And then and you got in in 2017? I did six and 18, 19 was my first full year. Wow. So what would you say if, if you, how, how do we put an annuity on a child and can we do that and how it grow for them? We can't do that. So can, can, what's the age? Is it 18? What is it? So that, so I just want agents to know, you know what I mean? Because I want them to walk away kind of with a lot of knowledge today. Yeah, I would say for people that are typically like um, 50 and under, and if they're healthy, an IUL makes more sense because you can put an IUL on a one month old, right? Like a million dollar baby. You put 50 to 100 bucks on an infant and you let 60 plus years of compounding interest, have, you've got seven figures. And, you know, and most infants are healthy enough, right? So, so I would say younger, healthier, where you can still withstand a lot of risk, 
everybody's risk tolerance is different. I've written annuities for people in their 20s and 30s and 40s because it's an old orphan 401k that's just hemorrhaging cash and they want it protected. But it's typically when you're younger and healthier and absorbing risk, get into those indexings that are a pay-as-you-go, an IUL, very similar concept, but it's a health-based product. And that's got the compounding interest. The IULs are wonderful. You know, they've got death, the disability, the cash, no cash, no risk, permanent policy, one and done. IULs are fantastic for accumulating wealth and deferring taxation. Yeah, those are great. Um, it's usually the people that are like not wanting to continue to start over again and again that you're looking at as an annuity client. So if they're under 59 and a half, you want to make sure that it's not an active uh, 401k or a 403b because they're not going to be able to roll that over if they're under 59 and a half. Unless it's from a previous company, then you know you can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. But age, age 18 and above, and then the older you get, some of the products have age limits. Like when you get up to age 82, 83, you're starting to move away from indexing options into fixed options. And then once you're 90, it's very limited. But we have a massive range of people we can serve with just the one license. You can do term, universal, and universal is either cash back or cash value accumulation. So term has no cash. But universal does either cash back or cash value accumulation based on the market index. And then you got whole life. And if you've got life and health with your license, then you can do a supplement, a Medicare supplement. There's no extra test for a supplement, not like A, HIP, and Part C, the advantage plans. It's just your life license. So term universal whole life supplement. Then you can do fixed and indexed annuities. Plus, you can recruit and build a team. You know, we've got six ways to make money with our license. Most people, myself included, when I started out, it was like final expense, final expense, <laughs> final expense. I just need to get paid, dude, right? And then I started opening it up, yeah. and it's like, oh, look, there's term, mortgage protection, I everything, man. This thing's like gold. It's like I've got a, a printing press with this license. I can just, like, print my own money. Yeah, no, it's amazing. So what if you you run into a client and they have, um, I have a scenario here. Um, they have a 401k rollover. They ne never been, they've never, it's deferred, right? They never paid taxes. If he doesn't touch it, it makes him 15K a year. He's got children. He does, he's interested in the, in the 18% bonus, but he is on the fence because he's already making 15K, right? I mean, so what, how would you steer yourself uh, towards something like that? And what would, what would you suggest um, that we could do to uh, help him? Cause he doesn't, he tried to get life insurance, but uh, at his age and everything, he's 78 and he still works part time, but, and he's got a ton of equity in his home. He's going to buy a second house in either Arizona or Nevada. Cause he's sick of paying taxes in California. And he's like, I, I am doing, and he was really open. He's like, I am doing really well. And I just really didn't. And I was thinking, I was like, heck, I'm with Brad on Thursday. I'm going to ask, and then I'll get back to you. Are you going to be around Thursday? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, we can help you. I'd love to help you. So what would, what would you suggest to that scenario? Okay. So repeat for me where the current investment is sitting. So right now it is a 401k and it's sitting, okay, and it's tax deferred. And if he doesn't touch it, every year he makes 15K. But if, and I said, well, why haven't you touched it? He goes, I don't want to pay the taxes. And I'm like, well, who are you going to leave it to? And he's like, my wife and kids, so. So at age 78 in a 401K, he's been taking required minimum distribution and, and that's about 4% of the account value. So like if you've got um, 100K, 4K is gonna have to come out because you're getting too old and Uncle Sam wants to see their tax dollars yeah. on your, right? So there's a requirement that you do a minimum distribution, approximately 4%. And that distribution gets added to your ordinary income to be taxed. 
Okay. So most people don't know what it is they actually have. I'm making 15K a year. Well, at age 78 with a 401k, that 15k is coming in the form of a distribution that is in fact getting taxed. Okay. But at age 78, that's the last age, 78, that you can do a 10-year contract. And depending on your state, it may be an 18% rollover bonus one time. So if he's got a million bucks. And he's rolling that over at age 78, that's a hundred and eighty thousand dollar bonus. So he's got three hundred and sixty thousand is what it is. So it's still good. I mean, and and so seventy-eight's the cutoff, you know. Yeah, okay. that's 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 over a fifty thousand dollar bonus, and he never goes down again based on the market. And then all those RMDs that uh, a theme in this case, they would help them manage those RMDs. It's like, hey, it's getting to that point in the year, you need to take out your minimum distribution so it could be taxed and they work with you on that. And they'll build that right into the illustration so the client can see it, right, or no? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I guess if we take anything away today, it's don't be afraid to use all the capabilities that your license gives you. And what, so when you first started you only sold two right and now you are mostly doing annuities and is it all re what's your week look like brad i mean are you how many hours i mean i, I like people that because you know um everyone thinks that they're going to be you know the andrew taylor's the brad allen's overnight and i don't think they realize what i mean you went 13 months without making a penny and your wife paid the bills, right? And you're like, I'm going to figure this out, honey, I swear. And that couldn't have been fun going home, you know? And I mean, tell between your legs, how'd you do? Oh, God, I, you know, I made a bunch of phone. I mean, every excuse known to man and woman, right? And it's it's tough. So I want people just to understand that this just didn't, you know, you you didn't wake up and were, weren't born selling annuities and what it takes to do it. And I really think, well, I like to, to share that with people because it's, it's tough. This is a very tough business. Yeah. It's, it's, um, everybody's got a plan until they get smacked in the face. That's one of my favorite things. <laughs> You're going to get smacked in the face. It's, it's not about getting smacked. It's about how you react to getting smacked. Like, Hey man, I ain't hurt. You just got to get up and go back to work. Right. So I work. I actually really enjoy working. I, I'm a grinder. So I get up at 4 a.m. every day, seven days a week, no alarm clock. Every day, 4 a.m., no alarm clock, seven days. I don't work Sundays. And I used to take appointments after 7 p.m. Now I don't. I mean, I still make my number, but um, I'm probably sitting uh, with at least 20 people a week. And, and even if you add up all of my production, since I've been with Family First Life five years, I still have sold more life volume than in it. Just barely. It's almost 50-50, but it's there's a little, like this year, I'll hit Hall of Fame again on life. I just did a 2000 a month premium and an NLG IUL last night at like nine o'clock. That, that's going to put me over the Hall of Fame numbers for, for life this year. And well, who'd, and then, you, who'd you use for that uh, IUL? What, what company? NLG? And so, so I would with my with IULs, if there's a comma in the monthly premium, I do NLG. And if it's just your run of the mill level death benefits, if they want the, the benefits of an IUL, but they only have a couple hundred bucks, two, three hundred bucks, then I go with Mutual of Omaha because it's, it's so quick and you find out right away. Yeah. Here's the thing, he's not your friend. So, so how do you? And so telling people what they could look like. Now, if you're running an illustration, you better be writing an application. Fair enough. Yeah. So, how, do you write any F and G or no? I haven't. No. See, I haven't either. I just love the app for NLG. I think it's really simple. It's easy. Uh, I like the company. I mean, it does take time, unfortunately. But if you build your pipeline, and I know a couple of. Uh, of the Hall of Famers, like, oh, you want to wait a month for your money? But man, when it comes in, it's exciting. You know what I mean? It's like, holy moly. But it does take time, and then you have to learn their systems and stuff. So, but once you figure it out, I think, I think it's pretty fair and pretty safe. And I think Athene's the same way. Um, I've dealt with them a couple times, and you get them right on the phone. 
that walk you right through an illustration. I mean, I would use our SRS team 100% because I would rather learn with the best that are on my team than use, because I don't know if those people, I mean, at Athena are going to, are doing this like we are. You know what I mean? I, I Kind of like the people at a team are like the old AMS team. They're not in the field. They don't know what it is to like have the, you know, uncertainty and, you know, let me think about it. And, you know, let me talk to my guy. They just understand how the products work and how to run an illustration, but they don't understand the sales side of the process. And that's where the SRS team comes in. I mean, if you're part of the SRS team, you better be on the leaderboard when it comes to issue case production or annuity, right? There's a couple of questions here I could answer for people. That'd be um, awesome. Converted into an IUL, not to my knowledge. I have not seen somebody, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I've never taken a term and converted it into an IUL. I've seen a term convert into a whole life. Okay, Americo has one of those products. You get to the end of the term and you get 10% of the death benefit forever kind of a thing, but I haven't seen it go term to IUL. That's, so that's, that's what I know about that one. And at what age do minimum distributions start for 401k? Well, so about four years ago, and for a long time, it was at age 70 and a half. And in December of 2019, the Fed raised the age from 70 and a half to 72. And then a year ago, they raised it again to age 73, or if you're below a certain age, like me, it's 75. So there's still required minimum distributions on pre-tax money, qualified money, but the illustration will show you at what age those R&Ds have to start coming out. Cool, any other questions? Well, there's... Somebody here that says, why does the theme illustration say subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal amount invested? So let's say that you put in 100K and you um, are adding a fee, right? And then, then the market goes down and um, your account value will go down because of the fee, but it won't go down because of the market. That's what they're trying to say there. There's no market-based activity once you move the money to an index annuity or a fixed annuity fixed or index they don't go down because of the market but they may drop because you added a fee right so fees could be either i want cash money or i want more of a participation in the market game well so if you're if you're upgrading your index inside the product to get a bigger return of what the market does but the market is down 20 points even with that fee that supercharged your uh, participation in the market, it didn't get above zero. So your account went down because of the fee, because you added that to the end. Otherwise, if you just do a standard performance elite seven, no bills, no whistle, there's no risk, no fee, and no cap. I love that product. No risk, no fee, and no cap. But they have to say that in there because you can add a fee if you want to, but you're, it's with perceived value, like cash money or more participation in the market. So that's, that's what that one's about. Awesome. I well, think. is there one more? No, so, I think that's it. Perfect. So Brad, thank you for taking time out of your busy week. We appreciate you. Thanks for uh, joining us on this podcast. I hope people learned. I hope you had a good time. Hope you have a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, sir. And I'll see you on the other side. Thank you for having me. Thank you.